This video is part of a board exam series I'll be doing. This one in particular covers PACOP based questions for Module 2 Biochemistry, specifically the Violet PACOP. I will be reading the question and pause for 5 seconds so you can answer. You can also pause the video if you need more time. Afterwards, I will give the answer and give a quick explanation. So yeah, let's start. Number one, which of the following is considered the most abundant and functionally diverse in living systems? Okay, so the answer to this question is A, proteins. So if you recall, proteins are polymers of amino acids that are joined together by peptide bonds. Proteins can be catalysts, can be transporters, storage, control metabolism, they can help in the immune system, they can be structural components, and they can be contractile proteins. Respective examples are enzymes for transporters, hemoglobin, and myoglobin. Storage, ferritin. So control metabolisms, hormones, yung polypeptide hormones such as insulin, glucagon, thyroid hormones immune system yung immunoglobulins structural components collagen and elastin are examples and for contractile proteins actin and myosin the ones in the muscle see number two which of the following statements is correct about protein structure Again, let's look at the statements one by one. The primary structure of a protein involves electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions, van der Waals interactions, and hydrogen and disulfide bonds. So, this is wrong. Yung electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions, etc., this refers to tertiary structure. The primary structure refers to the amino acid sequence. So, statement two. The secondary structure involves alpha helices, beta sheets, and other types of folding patterns that occur due to a regular repeating pattern of hydrogen bond formation. So this is correct. Alpha helices and beta sheets, these are examples of secondary structures of proteins. So wrong na yung A, wrong na yung B, and wrong na yung E. So statement 3. The tertiary structure consists of the amino acid sequence along the chain. So, as I've said earlier, the amino acid sequence refers to primary. So, wrong na yung 3. And statement 4, quaternary structure refers to the interaction of one or more subunits to form functional protein using the same forces that stabilize the tertiary structure. This is correct. So, that means D is the correct answer. So to summarize, primary structure refers to the amino acid sequence and is stabilized by peptide bonds. For secondary, recurring structural patterns to and are stabilized by hydrogen bonding. For Tertiary naman, this refers to the 3D conformation of a protein. And those mentioned here, yung electrostatic, hydrophobic, van der Waals, hydrogen disulfide bonds, and And for the quaternary structure, this refers to the interaction of two or more subunits. So take note that not all proteins have quaternary structure. A prime example would be hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four subunits. And if you compare that with myoglobin, myoglobin has only one subunit. So wala siyang quaternary structure. 
and the bonds present in the quaternary structure are similar to those in the tertiary structure. Okay, number three. Accumulated misfolded proteins occur in a variety of diseases. Which of the following proteins is misfolded in patients with Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so the answer to this one is B, beta amyloid. So, as you can see here, this is a photo of an amyloid plaque from a patient with Alzheimer's disease. San bang galing tong beta amyloid? As you can see in this photo, this is the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane of a neuron in the brain. And this molecule is called the amyloid precursor molecule. Yung APP, it is normally chopped by alpha and gamma secretase. So they chop it here. And the resulting fragments are soluble lang, so they do not cause any problems. However, if the APP is chopped by beta and gamma secretase, that's when we will have a problem. The resulting fragments are not as soluble and these accumulate which then form the plaques that we see here. Number four, hemoglobinopathies result from mutations that produce alterations in the structure of hemoglobin. One common mutation results in sickle cell anemia, in which a mutated form of hemoglobin distorts the RBC into a crescent shape at low oxygen levels. Sickle cell anemia happens when... Okay, the answer to this one is B. It happens when glutamic acid is being substituted by valine at position number 6. So to further explain that, here is the normal amino acid sequence. At position 6, you can see glutamic acid. However, in mutant hemoglobin, or HBS, it is replaced by valine. So what actually happens if a person has sickle cell anemia? So normally, diba, when a red blood cell, when it is deoxygenated, tanggalan ng oxygen, by concave pa rin yung shape niya. However, for those that have sickle cell anemia, when oxygen is released, the cells deform. This is because the hemoglobin polymerizes. And because of that, na decrease yung capacity to carry oxygen. So we use hydroxyurea as a drug, as a treatment for this. <coughs> this is because it makes your red blood cells bigger. It helps them stay rounder and more flexible and makes them less likely to turn into a sickle shape. Number five, acid-base disturbances occur under a variety of conditions. Which of the following is the result of hypoventilation due to retention of carbon dioxide in the lungs? The answer to this one is A, respiratory acidosis. So let us first establish na carbon dioxide is acidic. And when a person is hypoventilating, Hypo, it means that their breathing is too shallow or slow to meet the needs of the body. Meaning, the lungs cannot remove enough of the carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide levels rise and like, build up yung acid inside the lungs, which causes respiratory acidosis. For respiratory alkalosis naman, this is due to hyperventilation. So opposite. So sobrang bilis yung breathing, too much carbon dioxide is expelled, may imbalance na sa pH level sa, sa lungs, which causes the respiratory alkalosis. Molecules that contain an equal number of ionizable groups of opposite charge and therefore no net charge are termed as... 
Okay? The answer to this one is E. Zwitter ions. So, amino acids are zwitter ions when in their isoelectric pH. So, this is a zwitter ion. So, as you can see here, my negative charge, my positive charge. So, all in all, these cancel out. So, yung resulting charge, yung net charge, is ultimately zero. Take note that this only occurs in the amino acid's isoelectric pH. Okay. Number seven. In amino acids, the pH at which the number of positive charges equals the number of negative charges is termed as Okay, the answer to this one, as I've said earlier, is the isoelectric point, or PI. So, PI is the pH at which the amino acid exists in its zwitter ionic form. And take note na each amino acid has a different isoelectric point. So, wag kayo makonfuse ha. Zwitter ion is the molecule, while the isoelectric point naman is a numerical value. A pH number, to be exact. Problems associated with connective tissue and structural proteins are present in a number of diseases. In scurvy, hydroxylation of proline residues is decreased, and an unstable form of collagen is produced. Bleeding gums and poor wound healing are often observed. Which of the following vitamin deficiencies is associated to scurvy? Okay, the answer to this one is C, vitamin C. Now for the other choices, when you are deficient in vitamin A, you will have cerephthalmia and nyctalopia. which means dry eyes and night blindness. For vitamin E naman, this is actually in lab animals lang, scaly skin, sterility. For vitamin K, you will have blood clotting disorders. And in neonates specifically, Hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. And for vitamin D, rickets in children. And osteomalacia in adults. Which of the following is true about insulin functions? Okay, for statement one, insulin is released from the pancreas when blood glucose levels are decreased. So, this is wrong. Insulin is released from the pancreas, specifically the beta cells. However, they are released when blood glucose levels are elevated. Take note that insulin is released when you are fed. So, statement 2. Insulin promotes the transport of glucose into muscles and fat cells. This is correct. So, insulin puts glucose into the cells. That's how I remember it. And statement three, insulin increases glycogen catabolism in the liver and muscles. So this is wrong. Since insulin increases glycogen synthesis in the liver and muscle, meaning it increases anabolism. So, to recall lang, yung mnemonic ko dito is A, B, C, D. Anabolism builds, catabolism destroys. So, in the case of insulin, glycogen is built up in the liver and muscles. And for insulin promotes the storage of energy. 
This is true. This is store yung glycogen. So the answer to this one is E, two and four. Number ten. Evaluate the given statements. Competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate for binding at the allosteric site of the enzyme. So this is wrong. Competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate for binding at the active site. And two, non-competitive inhibitors bind to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex at the active site. So this is wrong. So here you can see that both are incorrect. So to review long, the substrate binds to the active site on the enzyme. In the case of competitive inhibition, the competitive inhibitor binds to the active site. So anong nangyari? Na unahan na yung substrate sa pagbind sa enzyme and the reaction cannot continue. And in the case of non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor goes to the allo allosteric site, which is a site different from the active site. And once nagbind na to, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change. So as you can see, naiba na yung shape sa enzyme. And as a result, the substrate, it cannot bind kasi iba na yung shape. 